All right. Good evening. Good to see everybody. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3? 1 John 3. We got enough volume back there? Can we turn it up a little bit more, guys? Not too much, but a little bit. All right, test, test, one, two, three. Test, test, oops, testing. Was I even on? All right, good. All right, once again, First John chapter 3. That might be a little hot now, Giovanni. Uh, just dial it back just a hair. Sorry. Sorry, guys, we'll get it. All right. Um, I don't want to start until they get it dialed in, so we... All right, test, test, one, two, testing, one, two. Okay, better. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, first, uh, first John chapter 3, and I just want to start off because we're kind of uh, picking up from last week and uh, want to kind of get a little bit of a running start uh, at the study. But years ago, in fact, I went online and checked, it was actually 1973, uh, that Hal Lindsey wrote a book called The Guilt Trip, The Guilt Trip. And in that book, he talked about how Satan loves to use guilt to condemn us and drive us from God, destroying our walk and neutralizing our witness. Of course, the only thing powerful enough to destroy Satan's guilt trips is understanding, of course, from God's word, God's grace and love. And yet many committed Christians now, I'm talking about those who love the Lord and really want to honor him, many Committed Christians fall into Satan's guilt trap, his guilt trap. And right here, John, the apostle writing this epistle, wants to help them get free. And so let's back up to verse 16. And uh, we read, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So first, the first thing John does is to... Um, state once again we've he's done this numerous times he'll continue to do it into chapter four but uh, he does this again to state how that uh, loving other christians is an evidence uh, a mark that a person's faith is genuine that they really do love jesus they have been you know really are children of god uh, he makes that point throughout uh, his epistle that you know you can't say you're a christian but don't love other Christians because the children of God love the family of God. And so he again says, look, how do you know you're saved? Do you love the brethren? Do you love?" And he, he talks about in verses 17 and 18, he talks about loving people tangibly, as we talked about last week, practically. If they need food, you give them something to eat. If uh, you could help them uh, you know, with the rent or mortgage because uh, they don't have the money, they're going to be evicted. If you can do it, help them. OK, uh, we the love of God is manifest in practical ways, not just in word, but in tongue and truth and so on. And he says in verse nine, 19, by this, we know that we are of the truth, that we are saved. He goes on to say, and shall assure our hearts before him. So, guys, victory over the devil begins with our salvation, but it doesn't end there. As we have been saying, salvation won't necessarily help you to live a fruitful, victorious life if you don't listen. Have the assurance that you are saved. Very important, okay? I mean, if Satan can get you to think that you are not saved because you're going to a church that teaches unless you keep all these rules and regulations and so on, you will lose your salvation. A lot of Christians think they have to get saved every week. Uh, my pastor used to go to a church like that many years ago, where uh, in his church, very legalistic, a lot of rules, regulations, dress codes, everything. And he said that every week he went up 
to receive Christ again because he felt he blew it and he was lost again. It wasn't until he began to really study the scriptures on his own, really study them in depth, where he began to realize it, it isn't works that saves us. It's God's grace. It's a gift, right? And that truth liberated him. Yes, he left the church he was in, and eventually God led him to be a pastor, but he wrote a book called Grace Changes Everything. Grace changes everything. When you really understand grace and how you're saved by grace, how you're sustained by grace, how you're eternally secure by God's grace, then perfect love manifested in grace casts out all fear. So we have to understand the devil is very astute. He, you know, he, he knows this, that if a person is saved, he's lost them. The next thing he, best thing he can do, though, is to neutralize their walk, to neutralize their effectiveness. This is a very important thing. Again, the idea is that we must have assurance if we're going to be fruitful, live victorious Christian lives. How can you be victorious over the devil as a Christian if you don't know you are saved? The word assurance, the dictionary defines it as full confidence, freedom from doubt, certainty. Now, assurance, guys, starts with self-examination self-examination as christians we are commanded to and i pulled these right from the scriptures judge yourselves so that you won't be judged by god someday judge yourself now am i real am i genuine am i really a christian uh, because if i don't judge myself now i may stand before jesus someday and he'll judge me he'll say i never knew you depart from me so judge yourselves so that you won't have to be judged by god someday make your calling and election sure are you really uh, one of the elect? Are you really saved? And then we studied this one last week. Examine yourself to make sure that you are really in the faith. Now, how do we do this? How do we do this? By looking for spiritual fruit in our lives. Or in other words, by looking for changes, transformation. Now, we're reviewing a little bit from last week. What we said last week, someone who is genuinely saved will undergo a transformation in how they think, how they talk, how they live, who they hang around with. All of these working together become an unmistakable testimony that they are saved and being transformed by the Holy Spirit from the inside out. So assurance is vitally important in our lives, in the lives of all of God's children. Again, essential for our victory, our fruitfulness, our service. Satan knows this, as, again. He knows it only too well, so he tries to use guilt and condemnation to shut us down. But the only way for the, the devil can use guilt and condemnation against us is by putting us under the law. As we said last week, legalism will destroy assurance every time. This is in, in the, When you are functioning in an environment of grace, when you understand God's grace, and you understand that you're saved by grace, you're kept by God's grace, everything is grace, as, the, as, as Newton said, you know, amazing grace, save me, and it's going to see me all the way home. It, unless you let the devil put you under the law. Now, how does that work? Well, as we said last time, there are many pastors and churches, church leaders, uh, in their zeal to see their people walking with God and bearing fruit. They place them under the law. They think this is the way to go. They don't trust the Holy Spirit to sanctify someone so they have to step in and play Holy Spirit and tell them what they can and cannot do. And of course, depending on the group, the list gets pretty lengthy, right? Uh, they tell them that unless they're constantly doing good works, going to church, uh, giving money to God, that's a big one. Uh, you know, staying away from, uh, you know, depending again on the group, uh, movies and uh, no drinking, no smoking. I'm, I'm not against teaching that. We shouldn't smoke or drink. But they make it a, a, a condition of salvation. You can't wear certain clothes and all kinds of things. Because if you do these things, you are either a phony Christian or you have lost your salvation and you get saved again. This constant emphasis on works and the corresponding condemnation that often accompanies it robs them of their assurance the assurance of their salvation, and the joy that comes from knowing that, again, they're saved by grace and eternally secure by God's grace, not 
their works. You can read Galatians 3 again, verses 1 to 3. So 1 John 3, 19 and 20, once again, and by this we know that we are of the truth. Well, go back to verses 17 and 18. Do we love the, the brethren tangibly when they have a need? So when we out there meeting needs and, and showing the body of Christ that, uh, you know, that we love them by, by meeting certain needs, uh, by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Before him, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Now, sometimes Christians go to good churches, not legalistic churches, but churches that teach grace. And yet they still battle with condemnation at times. This is often a result of having a tender heart. We, again, are reviewing a little bit from last week. But this is often the result of them having a tender heart towards God and a tendency to be too hard on themselves, too hard on themselves, constantly thinking that, you know, they're failures. They're a failure as a Christian. This is especially true with young believers. And boy, does Satan know this. That's why they need, it's like our children. When our kids were little, we didn't just send them out into the world to fend for themselves. They needed our protection until they were able to grow and think, for themselves as adults. When you have somebody who has just received Christ, they're a baby Christian. And they need the body of Christ, the family of God, to surround them, kind of watch over them, because they're very vulnerable. They're wide open to God now. They've just accepted Christ. The, the, the devil's lost them. But if you can get them down a path of false doctrine where their walk is neutralized, again, through legalism, we'll say, uh, they're no, not going to be a threat to the devil's kingdom. So that's why it's important that we, as a church, uh, you know, watch over the young ones in Christ. They're especially susceptible to the devil's condemnation. You know, they haven't had time to grow in their knowledge, uh, in their faith, and knowledge of the word. Um, they're still relatively ignorant with regard to, uh, you know, the doctrine of grace and, um, and God's love, his unconditional love, you know. They think they have to earn his love from day to day. It's legalism. You know, but the Bible teaches that God's love is unconditional. It's not it's not based on what I do for God or what I don't do. When I understand that, again, perfect love casts out fear. I'm no longer worried about not performing enough to earn God's love another day, to earn a place in God's kingdom another day. Tomorrow we start all over again with the good works and things to continue to uh, earn my salvation. This is very sad. Uh, no wonder. So many going to churches like this have no joy, no peace, no assurance. Uh, they're just a wreck. And, uh, of course, they're neutralizing their walk. They're not a threat to the devil. They're just so, so busy, worried about, uh, you know, going to heaven from week to week that they're not really worried about, you know, storming the gates of hell and uh, fighting against the enemy for his territory and so on. But... Um, and again, guys, I'm just wanting to review just briefly because the devil will use a tender heart against a person. Often, and it doesn't just mean, uh, I'm not coming against having a tender heart. I'm just saying, though, when you're a new believer, your heart is very tender towards God, right? The devil knows it, and um, he will often use that tender but immature heart against them. You know, again, through the law, uh, putting all these rules and things on them that they think they have to do to, to earn God's love again for another day. And so he can easily condemn them. I mean, they're not going to lose their salvation if they're genuinely saved, but uh, they can begin to lose the assurance of that salvation due to a heart that keeps on condemning them. And John comforts them here in verse 20 by saying, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. He's talking about Christians now who love God, who want to serve the Lord, who want to be uh, honor Him and obey Him, but fall short, blow it. We all are there. And John knows. He see, he's seen many people in his day who fit this description. These are good-hearted people who love God, are saved, and yet they are constantly, constantly on themselves. John said, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And knows all things. Now you might be thinking, great, wonderful. What exactly does that mean, though? It's John's way of saying that sometimes a child of God can be overly hard on them on themselves, where they, you know, set the bar so high 
that they begin to have unrealistic expectations in their walk with the Lord. Expectations so high that it borders on perfection. So that any sin, no matter how small or unintended, becomes the justification to condemn themselves as worthless failures. Guys, this extreme legalism becomes so burdensome and so exhausting that eventually they can't live with the guilt of failure any longer. And they either walk away from the Lord. This is what legal. This is the legacy of legalism. Years ago, studying through Genesis on Sunday morning, I remember I, I pulled a, a message out um, and I called it the, the legacy of legalism. Uh, it's a terrible thing when you live under that system. Um, and a lot of people just can't do it. And so eventually they get so discouraged because they're constantly failing. They're trying their best to earn God's favor, but they just fail all the time. So eventually they either just give up and walk away, or even worse, they commit suicide. And I have told you that we had a lady come into this church for about a month who had escaped a very legalistic church and uh, had come here, and all our folks constantly met with her and because she was just so wrapped up in the legalism. And our, our women were ministering to her all the time, uh, constantly, trying to show her in the scriptures where it's by grace and so on. And we thought we were getting through, but after about a month or so, she just was so tied to that thinking and so tied to her old church, she went back to it. And about a month or so after that, she committed suicide. The family was so upset with this church, and they knew she had come to our church for a while, the, the daughter contacted me and asked me to do her funeral. And uh, very sad. I believe she was saved. But the problem with legalism is it brings, it allows the devil to, to use so much guilt and condemnation against you. You know, unless you, unless you come to know God's grace in truth, you're going to either walk away after a while or something worse. Now look, I'm not saying that Small sins, quote unquote, aren't an issue, and only you know big sins need to be taken seriously. Remember what Solomon said in Song of Solomon, chapter two, verse fifteen. He said, "It's the little foxes that spoil the vine," and I've always interpreted that to mean it was just his way of saying it's the little sins that fly under our radar, but often rob us of our fruitfulness for God. I think most Christians stay away from all the big sins. Okay. Uh, you know, they're, they're not out there stealing, robbing banks, or running around committing adultery over the place. But the, the point is, though, that oftentimes it's the sins that, you know, we, again, fly under our moral radar, coveting, okay, covetousness, uh, or um, gossip. Oh, but I'm only sharing prayer requests. I see. We can make anything sound spiritual, Okay. But uh, it's often those sins that rob us of our fruitfulness for God. So I'm not, I, I'm not saying that any sin is really a small sin. Uh, God takes all sins very seriously. He expects us to take all sin very seriously as well. What I'm talking about, though, is that we are all like little children learning how to walk. And when we do fall to sin, God wants us to acknowledge our sin to confess it, to repent of it, and listen, to get up and start walking with him again. It's over. It's under the blood. It's been forgiven, removed. God drowns it in the sea of forgetfulness, remembers it no more. What the devil wants, though, is to tempt us to sin, and when we do fall into sin, he wants us to condemn ourselves. In other words, stay down. Give up. Uh, this proves you're nothing but a worthless failure. God's tired of listening to you say you're sorry for this sin you keep committing. God's done with you. He's had it. And if you let that thinking get into your head, well, you know, that's the problem. You know, people do listen to the devil's condemnation because already they're so prone to beat themselves up and, and so entrenched in this idea that I have to earn God's love every day well, they're just, they're just ripe to be uh, beaten to death by the devil. And let me just say this. Often, we hand Satan the bat that he ultimately uses to beat us up with. And how do we do that? By trying to prove to God our love 
and devotion. How do we do that? By making God promises that things are going to be different. Okay. You watch, Lord, I'll show you. Maybe you've done this very thing, where you've made the Lord a promise, a promise that with all your heart you intended to keep. Maybe you said to him, Lord, that's it. I'm going to quit smoking, or I'm going to quit drinking, or I'm going to quit looking at pornography. Or maybe you said, Lord, things are going to be different between us. I'm going to start getting up earlier so I can spend some time with you in prayer before I start my day. Good stuff. Or I'm going to stop watching so much TV and spend that extra time in the Word. Or maybe you purpose to start being more of a verbal and visible witness for the Lord at work or some other place. All good stuff, good intentions. If you've ever promised the Lord things were going to be, you know, different, you were going to make some changes, uh, you were going to be more committed, only to fail and feel the guilt that comes from failing to keep your promise to the Lord. But you know what? You're, you're in good company because that's exactly how Simon Peter felt. This is such an important topic. I wanted to merge First John tonight with a teaching I did several years ago that came out of Matthew. And in that teaching, we, we talked about how that Peter, the evening before Jesus was crucified, in the upper room, as Jesus um, was with his uh, disciples, they were observing the Passover together. You remember what he told them. Now, I pulled this from uh, numerous gospels. I'll just piece it together to get the, the flow of what happened that evening. Okay, now, this is the night before the cross. Okay. He said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he, Peter, said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake, Peter? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow twice till you have denied me three times. But he spoke more vehemently, Lord, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Was Peter sincere? You think he was sincere? I think so. I, I think with all his heart he was sincere. And I believe with all his heart he meant to keep that promise to his Lord. The spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. And that's the problem with making God promises. No matter how sincere or well-intentioned they are, you're putting confidence in your strength and not confidence or relying on his strength. And again, guys, you can't use the flesh to defeat the flesh. You can only defeat the flesh through the, through the work and power of the Holy Spirit. That's why New Year's resolutions don't work, because I'm making promises to use my strength to overcome my weaknesses. You can't use the flesh to defeat the flesh. Jesus told all his disciples that they would forsake him before the night was out, yet Peter assured the Lord, oh, now, Lord, come on. I know you've been working hard and... Things have been rough, and but listen, okay, I, I, I'm with you, all right? I got your back. Uh, you know, you can imagine, right? But uh, Peter assured the Lord that, you know, his love and commitment to him was stronger than the other disciples. He promised Jesus that even though the other disciples would fail him, he said, I will never fail you. You can count on me, Lord. I won't let you down. I'm Rocky Johnson. Peter, Petros, Rock, John, uh, son of John, Johnson, I'm Rocky Johnson, Lord, I got your back. <laughs> However, nine or ten hours later, after Peter made that promise, Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and was put on trial by the Sanhedrin in the home of the high priest Caiaphas. And Peter was out in the courtyard of Caiaphas's house, warming, warming himself by the fire. It was April. Uh, it was Passover, so it was you know, still chilly. And uh, he was standing by where the soldiers were. They had built a fire. He was uh, 
standing by the fire, warming himself, waiting to see what was going to happen to Jesus. You remember the story, of course. And it was while he was there that three times he was accused of being one of Jesus' disciples. And three times he said adamantly, I don't even know the man. Now, Luke tells us something about that scene that no other gospel writer records. Luke tells us that immediately after Peter denied the Lord for the third time, that Jesus, from where he was standing in Caiaphas' house, turned and looked at Peter. What kind of look did he give Peter? We're not told. We're left to speculate. Was it a look of anger? A lot of Christians think that when they fail God, God is angry with them. Maybe it stems from having an earthly father who was hard on them. A father who they could never please, who never acknowledged their accomplishments, but only condemned them for their failures. And so now when they fail as a Christian, they imagine their heavenly father saying in their earthly father's voice, I told you you were no good. You're nothing but a failure. You'll always be a failure. And I'm sick and tired of putting up with you. Now get out of my sight. Was it a look of disappointment? There are many Christians who, when they fail, think God they have let God down. They imagine the voice of God whispering in their ear something to the effect, I I can't believe you did that. I expected more from you. You've really disappointed me. I mean, this produces an incredible amount of guilt and shame, which causes them to want to run and hide from God, kind of like Adam, after he sinned, hid from God, right? Or maybe Jesus gave Peter a look of sadness. Often we feel that our failures cause God to look at us, you know, with the kind of sad look that one would give to a person who has a lost cause. That the Lord is looking at us, shaking his head, you know. Like we would look at some sad, pathetic loser who, no matter matter how many chances he has given, always blows it and will never amount to anything in life. Of course, that causes a person to feel like it's no use trying anymore. I'll never amount to anything, so I'm just going to give up. Let me ask you, what kind of look do you think Jesus gave Peter that night. And I'll say this to you. The look you think Jesus gave Peter in the light of his failure reveals how you think Jesus looks at you when you fail as a Christian. Well, let me weigh in. First of all, I don't believe that Jesus looked at Peter with a look of anger. The Bible teaches that God's anger is reserved for those living in rebellion who refuse to repent for their sins. Not for those who try to live for him, but sometimes fail. I also don't believe that Jesus looked at Peter with a look of disappointment. For you see, for God to be disappointed means uh, you did something that took him by surprise. In other words, he appointed you up here. You didn't rise to the level of his expectations, so you disappointed him. You took him by surprise. He acted in a way you, he didn't expect. And of course, that's impossible for God because he knows all things. He has all knowledge. And uh, in fact, he knew every sin we were ever going to commit before he even created us. We know Peter's denial of Jesus didn't catch the Lord off guard and disappoint him because when, when uh, Peter promised the Lord that he would never be stumbled because of him, Jesus told Peter that before the night was out, he was going to deny him three times. Now, I believe Jesus told Peter this in advance, not only to warn him not to put his, you know, his uh, trust in his own strength, but also to prepare him to soften the blow of his failure by teaching Peter and through Peter, all of us, that our sins never surprise or disappoint God. Grieve him, yes. Surprise him, no. Because he knew everything we were ever going to do. And finally, I don't think that Jesus gave Peter a look of sadness. 
the kind of look we might give a person who was a lost cause, a, hope, a lost cause, a hopeless loser, the kind of person we often feel like, right, for blowing in as much as we do, which causes us to say, Lord, I'm hopeless, you know. I'll never amount to anything as a Christian. Why don't you just, you know, give up on me? I've given up on myself, forgetting that Paul the Apostle wrote to the Philippian church that we are all a work in progress. He said, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We are a work in progress. No, we're not what we want to be yet, but we certainly are not what we once were. So, uh, you know, you get saved, and God, imagine, he just takes a, sticks it to your forehead, it says, under construction. Okay. You don't see it. He sees it, you know. And uh, because we're a, a work in progress, we're all under construction, um, he understands, you know. It takes time to build a life. It takes time for God to dismantle all the garbage we have built in our hearts and minds and lives uh, before he can start rebuilding, right? Remember what he said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1? He was only 17, I think, at the time. He told him to go to Israel and beyond that to the nations around. He said, I'm sending you, he said, to pull down, to tear down, to uproot, to build, and to plant. This goes for anything in our life. Marriage is a good one. You know, people are married for years. Their marriage is a disaster. They get saved. They don't wake up the next day and have an ideal marriage. I mean, they wake up the next day and they're on their way to one if they want God to work. But it takes time for God to tear down the junk the selfishness, the pride, the hurts, and to begin to rebuild something that is beautiful. And this goes for our entire life. So, you know, something to think about. You might be thinking to yourself, okay, Phil, what kind of look do you think Jesus gave Peter? Well, obviously, I don't know for sure, but I personally believe it was a look of loving compassion. You know, the kind of look a parent would give a child who is learning to walk but keeps falling you're teaching a little child how to walk and they keep falling you don't get angry i mean no normal parent gets angry you know starts yelling and screaming that's it you're not eating tonight but dad i'm only two i mean you know, uh or one whatever you know uh god knows that when we get saved we're a baby christian and he takes extra time with us to bring us along, to teach us how to walk. You don't have to turn there. You can write the reference down. Uh, this really is driven home in Hosea chapter 11. Uh, I'll read verses 1 to 4 and then verse 8, uh, where God said, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. But the more I called to him, the farther he moved from me offering sacrifices to the images of Baal and burning incense to idols. I myself taught Israel how to walk, leading him along by the hand. You get the image of a, a little child. You know how you stand over them and you got their hands, you know, and as you walk, you know, you're and they're walking, and, but you're doing it for them, kind of teaching them how to walk. God says, that's what I did when Israel was a child. I took them by the hands and I taught them how to walk. Verse 4, I led Israel along with my ropes of kindness and love. I lifted the yoke from his neck and I myself stood and, uh, and uh, to feed him. Oh how, oh, how can I give you up Israel? God's lamenting because the nation turned from him. He taught them how to walk in the ways of righteousness and they went off into idolatry. And he's lamenting. He said, oh, how can I give you up, Israel? How can I let you go? My heart is torn within me, and my compassion overflows. Now look, God ultimately did forgive his people. And the thing I want to leave you with, uh, with regard to this, is if, if the Lord can forgive Israel for their rebellion, uh, their rebellion under the law, don't you think he will forgive you for your weaknesses? 
and failings now that you're his child under grace. Look, guys, and I'm sure most of you know this, but it's good to be reminded because even those of us who have walked with the Lord for a long time, the devil waits until we're at a real weak point. And we have these things along the way. You know, maybe physically something's going on and just you're feeling very weak. And of course, it, it, it has a way of affecting everything, your way you think, the way your spiritual life. Uh, maybe your marriage isn't doing so well right now, or you have a wayward child, or or a financial situation. These are all work uh, in our lives to to weaken us. And the devil's patient; he waits until we're going through a period where we are, we are very vulnerable and weak to hit us. At that point, sometimes we're prone to begin to wonder, "Well, does God really love me?" Now we've walked with God for thirty years, maybe. This goes to show you, though, that even after all those years, the devil can do things where you begin to even second think God's love for you and so on. Let me just assure you, God loves you. He's not angry with you. He's not up in heaven condemning you for your failures. He knew all the times you were going to fail before he ever created you. And listen, he still wanted you to be his child. How many adoptive parents, if they had all knowledge of what this child would eventually grow up to be, how many of them, if they had access to that information and the child was going to become, wasn't going to be good, would still go ahead and adopt the child? Probably not, right? Yet God had full knowledge of all of us and still wanted us to be his children. And now that we are his kids, He's not going to condemn you and me because we're weak and sometimes fail and fall in our walk with him. Paul the Apostle made this abundantly clear in Romans chapter 8 when he asked the question, why would God condemn the very people he sent his son Jesus to die for, those who are now his children? Again, guys, God knows our weaknesses. In fact, he knows us better than we know ourselves. And he isn't putting any confidence in our strength, okay? Psalm 103, verses 8 to 14. Why don't you turn there, all right? It's a great psalm to highlight. We tend to put confidence in the flesh. We tend to be like Peter, thinking that we're stronger than everyone else. Although these deny you, I will never deny you, Lord. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. Verse 10, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear Him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. God knows that we are weak and prone to failure. And guys, again, he's not condemning us for those failures. In fact, he uses them. He uses our failures to teach us how to walk with him better in the future. As someone has written, I went to the throne with a trembling heart. The day was done. Have you a new day for me, dear master? I've spoiled this one. He took my day all spoiled and blotted and gave me a new one all unspotted. And into my tired heart he cried, Do better now, my child. Let me close with a true story. Um, you've heard me say it before. It so fits with this whole theme. I wanted to repeat it. Uh, maybe you haven't heard it. Maybe, you know, uh, you're relatively new at Calvary here. But... Uh, this story, true story, came from one of our Calvary pastors, okay? And um, his son, uh, his name is William. And uh, at the time of this story, William was about seven years old. It seems that William was a rambunctious little boy who often pushed the patience of his teachers. And so one Sunday, while driving home from church, William who was unusually quiet, 
suddenly blurted out, Dad, is God watching me? William's father knew something was behind that question, so he asked, Why do you ask me that, William? Did someone tell you God is watching you? William responded in a sheepish tone. My Sunday school teacher told me God is watching me. Is it true, Dad? Is God really watching me? William's father probed deeper. Why did your Sunday school teacher tell you God is watching you, William? Well, because I was kind of acting up in class. But, but is it true, Dad? Is God watching me? Now, this pastor was pretty sharp. And he knew that the way he answered that question had the potential to shape William's concept of God for many years to come. So he prayed quickly for wisdom and then said to his son, Yes, William, it's true. God is watching you. He's watching you because he loves you so much he can't take his eyes off of you. And the same is true for all of God's children. Yes, God is watching you. He's watching you not because he's angry with you or disappointed in you or, or disgusted when you fail. He's watching you because he loves you so much he can't take his eyes off of you. And like any parent, he wants what's best for you. And so he patiently keeps watching over you, protecting and guiding you each day. And when you fail, and you're going to fail, I mean, we all fail. When you fall, fail and fall, he stands ready to pick you up, dust you off, take you in his arms and whisper in your ears, I forgive you, child. Now draw your strength from me and I'll teach you how to walk with me better in the future. Again, we are all a work in progress. And he knows um, and, and he who has begun that work is going to see it all the way to completion. So again, guys, be encouraged. Draw close to your loving Heavenly Father from day to day for His strength. And remember, as John said, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Remember, when Peter failed, he went out and wept bitterly. For three days, when Jesus was in the grave, Peter had isolated himself. He was devastated. He made the Lord a promise he fully intended to keep, but he was too weak to keep it. He buckled, fear gripped his heart, and he denied the Lord three times. The first person that Jesus appeared to after his resurrection was Peter. Later on, they went fishing all night and caught nothing. In the morning, Jesus stood on the bluff, called out to them on the Sea of Galilee. You know, children, have you caught any fish? You always, you know, you ever you've gone fishing, that's just the standard response. You know, somebody talks to you from the shore. You know, have you caught, caught anything fish biting today? That kind of thing, you know. And uh, so uh, they said nothing. And Jesus said, well, cast your net on the other side of the boat. And when they did, it was so filled with fish the boat began to sink. Well, that's exactly what happened when Jesus first called these guys to come follow him. And so Peter, uh, it was either Peter or John said, hey, it's the Lord. I think John said, it's the Lord. So Peter dives into the Sea of Galilee and swims to shore. And Jesus already got fish on the fire, right? And some bread. And then the Lord begins to restore Peter. Peter denied him three times. And so now the Lord says, three different times. Peter, do you love me? You remember though, if you study the Greek a little bit, you will see how that Jesus says, asks Peter, Peter, do you agape me? Now that's a word that is in scripture for God's love. It's an unconditional, um, passionate, uh, full-hearted kind of a love. Because that's what Peter had said earlier, right? Though these, these guys don't love you like I do, Lord. My love is way better than theirs. So Jesus said, Peter, do you agape me? Love me passionately, unconditionally, and so on. Peter responds, you know, Lord, that I love you. But he used the lesser word in the Greek, phileo, which means a fondness. 
Jesus said, feed my sheep or tend, feed my lambs. He again asked the second time, Peter, do you agape me? Love me fervently, unconditionally, passionately. And again, Peter responds, you know, Lord, that I am fond of you. Feed my lambs. The third time, Jesus said to Peter, he comes down to his level. He says, Peter, do you phileo me? Are you really fond of me? Now, this broke Peter. Because I believe with all his heart, he wanted to say to Jesus, yes, I agape you. But he knew. He had just let the Lord down. He had just denied him three times. He would have been a hypocrite to say, oh, you know, Lord, I love you unconditionally and wholeheartedly and passionately. I believe you wanted to say it. His heart condemned him. His heart condemned him because he had failed so miserably. So now the Lord comes down to his level. It says, well, Peter, are you fond of me? That broke him because it's like, Lord, at least, you know, I'm fond of you. I love to say I got you. I can't. My heart condemns me right now because of my failure. But Lord, give me that, that I, I'm fond of you. And what did Peter say? Lord, you know all things. You know that I'm fond of you, that I love you. And Jesus said, you know, tend my sheep. This is what John was talking about. John was standing there while this exchange was going on. I don't know, maybe John was drawing from this very incident with Peter when he says, if our heart condemns us, he is greater than our heart and knows all things. Guys, there are times when we fail the Lord, but honestly, we do love him with all our heart. We would love to say that, but we feel like a hypocrite because how can I tell Jesus I love him with all my heart and look what I just did. John is saying, sometimes our actions don't always indicate what's really in our heart. So we blow it. Our heart condemns us. But God says, I know your heart. I see deep inside your heart. And I know you really love me. Now, like Peter, what he would say to us is, don't put your faith and strength in your own strength. If you want to be victorious, if you want to uh, have a life that honors God and obeys God, you have to just submit to his strength, you know? Let him live his life through you. That, you know, he, he will do what he wants to do, you know? Um, very important lesson. And um, it's a good lesson for us to learn now because I, I run into so many Christians today who are failing. Some are giving up. You've heard stories of well-known Christ, well Christian leaders who are given up, walking away from the faith. Unfortunately, we just had uh, an assistant pastor of Greg Laurie's commit suicide the other day. Now, he did battle with depression. He was open about it. He and his wife even led groups in the church uh, to help people with suicidal depression. It just got the best of him the other day, and he took his own life. That's a little different because I think he was dealing with some chemical issues. But there are a lot of pastors who are committing suicide. They, their hearts are condemning them. And they're listening to the devil. Don't do that. You've got to fall back on what God has said about his love for you. How unconditional it is. How it's all about grace. And if I just bring myself to God and say, Lord, I am so weak right now. I, I, I can't do anything. I need your strength. I need you to uh, work within me. And uh, to live your life through me. He will do that. But, you know, the devil, he waits till you're at a real weak point and then he comes after you. And uh, at very least, he'll, he'll kill your walk. At worst, he'll kill your body. So be very careful, all right? We'll pick it up next time and uh, we'll continue and finish the chapter, maybe get into chapter four. But um, 
John wants to, to, to just comfort us. And, uh, and I think his words really do that when you understand the context. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. And that you know our hearts, Lord. Just like you knew Peter's heart. You knew he really loved you. He was putting too much confidence in his own strength. And um, it's interesting, Lord, that for those three days you were in the tomb, Peter thought his relationship with you was over. Any future ministry was done. He had blown it uh, beyond repair. He didn't realize that his greatest, day, greatest days of ministry were yet future. That you had to let this godly man fall and fall hard so that he stopped putting his uh, confidence in his own strength and that he would look to you for strength. And Lord, we all need to be broken. <laughs> we all think we're Rocky Johnson. Give us grace, Lord, to realize, no, we are as weak and unstable as water. Give us grace to just draw close to you for strength. You're the rock. Give us grace to build our lives continuously upon your strength. Father, we thank you. We ask all this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.